We are continuing this morning our series on forgiveness. Someone wrote a little verse that goes like this. To live above with those we love, that will be glory. To live below with those we know, well, that's a different story. <laughs> Reminding us of the challenge of relationships. And in that challenge comes the need for forgiveness. And so the question is, how do we learn to forgive? How do we learn to forgive? I mentioned at the beginning of the service that uh, Fred Luskin, one of the major researchers in forgiveness, says that we learn to forgive through practicing forgiveness. That that's the chief way we learn it and that we practice forgiveness in ways that are small and seemingly insignificant And we do it intentionally so that when the bigger things come, we will have practice in the process of forgiveness. You remember that we are defining forgiveness as the difficult, intentional process of letting go of an old reality and opening oneself to the possibility of a new reality. I want to say that definition again, and every word in it is important. The difficult, intentional process of letting go of an old reality and opening oneself to the possibility of a new reality. Over these past few weeks, as I have watched documentaries about forgiveness and studied forgiveness, I have, I've learned a lot. And I had no idea until I began to look at this, how much research there's been done, and really only in the last 10 or 15 years, most of it, on forgiveness. What is the process like? And what does it mean to forgive? And what's the result of forgiveness? And what's its importance today? among nations, within nations, in families, in communities, and at every level and all kinds of relationships. Everett Worthington is one of the major contributors to this ongoing study of forgiveness, and in some ways a pioneer of uh, these studies in forgiveness. And Everett Worthington has a five-step process of forgiveness that he calls REACH, Reach. He calls it reach because each letter stands for one of those steps in the process. And the first R is for recall the hurt. He says the first thing we have to do is recall the hurt. That if we are to learn to forgive, then we must be intentional about recognizing the hurt and the damage that's done. And, and, and we must recognize our feelings about that. Uh, What is the level of my anger? What is the resentment that I hold? How long has it been? And what is the temperature of those emotions at this point? Recalling the hurt. The second part of the process is empathize. Empathize, And Everett Worthington says that that's a very difficult part of the process, and he learned that very personally in his own family. See, he had been doing research in forgiveness for quite some time and had already developed these steps when he had the tragic experience of losing his mother. She was murdered during a robbery. And so suddenly... He was faced with following these steps in a way that he never imagined he would have to. And empathizing is one of those steps. And he said what that meant for him was trading in an old set of emotions for a new set of emotions. Letting go of an old reality and opening oneself to a new reality. Letting go of the old emotions of unforgiveness, bitterness, and hatred, 
and anger and opening himself to a new possibility of empathy and compassion. And so he was faced, along with his siblings, with the task in this difficult, intentional process of empathizing with the perpetrator of this terrible crime. What was the life of that person like? How did did he grow up? What was his home condition? What was his history? Was he addicted? What was going on? And he said as he began to empathize, to That is, to try to feel what that person was feeling, to try to understand something about that person, and to be in touch with his own sinfulness, his own culpability, that is, his own possibility of doing wrong, then that helped him in that healing and forgiving process. Empathize. The third part is altruistic gift of forgiving. The altruistic gift of forgiving. Worthington says that this is really important, that it's, it's altruistic. It is giving that is sacrificial. It's giving purely for the sake of, of giving when you forgive. And it's difficult. It's difficult along with all the other steps in the process, but it's a gift. And because of the work he had done on forgiveness, he had already received a gift that then he was able to give. And it wasn't a gift that he gave to someone else. It was a gift that he gave to himself. The gift of forgiveness allowed him to move on in life. It allowed him to live into a new reality, to let go of the old and to live into this new reality, this altruistic gift of forgiving. The next step is C. That is to commit publicly to forgive. It's a pretty simple thing, pretty simple principle that if we really want to do something and we want to hold ourselves to it, we tell someone else. I heard one, so, someone say one time, it's throwing your hat over the fence. You throw your hat over the fence, then you've got to cross the fence to get it. You have to follow the hat. And they said it's that way. If you want to do something important, announce it. Tell people you're going to do it. Then you have to do it. Worthington said that's a part of the process of forgiveness. Tell someone else. Forgiveness is not simply something we do alone inside of ourselves, but we tell someone else to help hold us accountable to completing that difficult work of forgiveness. And the last step is holding on to forgiveness. Forgiveness is slippery. It's difficult to hold on to. Sometimes forgiveness requires a daily recommitment to letting go of the old and opening ourselves to the possibility of of a new reality, holding on to forgiveness. During these past few weeks, I have read and heard remarkable stories of forgiveness, like Matthew Boger, who works for um, the Tolerance Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, Matthew Boger, as floor manager of the museum, had lunch one day with a volunteer of the museum to talk about a project. And in the midst of their conversation, they talked about where they grew up and and they realized that they went to the same hamburger stand growing up. And in an instant, he looked into the eyes of this other man named Tim Zale. He looked into Zale's eyes and he recognized in an instant that this man was one of a gang of skinheads that had beaten him nearly to death, beaten him to unconsciousness because he was gay. And he didn't quite know how to handle that. And after that revelation, after that shock, the two did not speak for a long time. 
Boger decided the only way he could move forward would be to let go of that old reality and open himself to some kind of new reality. And so he, he called Zale up and he offered forgiveness. And now the two of them speak. They go around and they speak about this process of forgiveness and, and, and what it means. This facing square on the hurt that was done, the ability to somehow empathize with the life of the other person, the giving of this altruistic gift, and then this public commitment to forgive, and then through this friendship and through their speaking, they are holding on to forgiveness as this process continues to unfold. It's remarkable. Or think about the story of Michael Weiser. Michael Weiser was cantor in his uh, Lincoln, Nebraska synagogue. And he became the target for the local clan. A man named Larry Trapp was the grand dragon of the local clan chapter. And he began to make harassing phone calls, threatening phone calls, horrible phone calls, full of hatred. And of course, Michael Weiser was frightened. He wondered what he was capable of. But he learned that Larry Trapp was confined to a wheelchair, and so Weiser made a decision. He made a commitment to give the altruistic gift of forgiveness to himself and to Larry Trapp. And so he started returning the calls. And after he would sit through this long phone answering message full of hatred, propaganda, he would leave a message. Hey, this is Michael Weiser. I'm calling to see if I can help you in any way. Maybe I can bring you groceries. Perhaps I can take you to run errands. And he left messages day in and day out. And finally, Larry Trapp called him and said, why are you harassing me? He said. <laughs> he said, I want to help you and I want to forgive you. And Larry Trapp said, can, can we talk? I want to get out of this. And Weiser said, I'll be right over. And so he took lunch over and they talked. And eventually, remarkably, Larry Trapp, as his health declined, moved in with the Weisers. He converted to Judaism. Think about that. The power of this witness of faith. He converted to Judaism because of what he saw in the Weisers. And there was a whole new reality. What a remarkable story of the power of forgiveness to create something new and to let go of something old. The Apostle Paul talks in this, in this uh, passage for today about putting on something new. Earlier in the chapter, he talks about letting go or putting to death the old, but putting on something new. And as Mr. Mark told us a moment ago. That's compassion, it's kindness, it's humility, it's meekness. It's also forgiveness, it's patience, and above all, it's love. This call to a new reality, to get rid of the old and put on the new. We learn to forgive as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We learn to forgive as we practice forgiveness in the small things. We learn to forgive as we learn more about the dynamics of forgiveness and the power of it to enter into a process that's very intentional, though difficult, that takes us to a new destination. Now, as we live into that, we have to be gentle with ourselves. We have to be forgiving of ourselves. 
There is no sense in beating yourself up for the way it is right now for you. Perhaps where you are is this, in this place where you just cannot imagine forgiving. But as you enter into that process, as you seek to find that new reality, let, letting go of the old, be gentle with yourself and know that it is a process and it takes time. Corey Tinboom, who had much to forgive, she was a prisoner in a concentration camp, Nazi concentration camp, a Christian, said that there was one particular person that she had forgiven, but she couldn't, she couldn't get, she just couldn't get the hurt out of her mind. She just couldn't seem to forget it. She couldn't seem to, to let it go. Of course, she would always remember it, but but it just kept coming back to her. And, and those feelings of anger and resentment and rage and bitterness, she said, I had intentionally forgiven, but it just kept coming back. And she said, I wasn't sleeping well. She said, after two weeks of hardly sleeping at all and tossing and turning and just being tormented by this, she went to see her Lutheran pastor. And she poured all this out to him and, and she said, what, what, can I, what can I do? And he said, Corey, in the tower of this church, there's a bell. And he said, the sexton comes and rings the bell by pulling on the rope and pulls on the rope. And as the bell begins to swing, it tolls and he keeps pulling on the rope to ring the bell. And at a certain point, he lets go of the rope. But after he lets go of the rope, the bell continues to ring. Ding, dong, ding, dong. And then ding and ding and perhaps quieter. And it finally fades. He said, what's happening with you is that those images are continuing to ring like the bell. You've let go, but after we let go, it takes a while. So he said, give yourself time for healing. That's a good word for us. And a good word for us to end today is Paul's final words in our text. What Paul says is, whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You all know that in Semitic thinking, names and words are very important. In the Bible, when someone gets a new life, they get a new name, typically. Because a name means something, it has power, it represents the whole person, their character, their nature, their past, their future. It's all captured in the name in a way that, in a significance that names really don't have for us. And so to do something in the name of someone is to do it in the spirit of that person, in the will and the way of that person, to, to do it in the, in the manner that that person would do it. And so Paul says, whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question that really challenges me as I think about this whole business of forgiveness and my relationships with other people is can I do or can I hold in my heart what I'm doing or what I'm holding in my heart in the name of Jesus Christ? Can I hold this grudge in the name of Jesus Christ? Can I harbor that resentment in the name of Jesus Christ? What a challenging question. Can I forgive? Can I make a new start? Can I let go of the old? Can I learn to do this difficult thing called forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Oh God, we need your strength and our weakness to engage in the difficult, intentional process of letting go of the old reality and 
opening ourselves to a new reality, this process of forgiveness. Give us your strength by your grace to do this difficult work. And to be able in what we do and what we say to do it in Jesus' name. Amen.